Ellison, look, I'll just keep asking until we answer or don't, I mean, yes, no. Um, should I take it as a no? All right, I see, thank you, Jayla, I appreciate that. Um, you guys know, especially from week one where um, I shared how to read African-American lit. One of the ways you read African-American lit is you have to um, look up the author. You have to, like it, it really will be a waste of time to read it without knowing who wrote it. How does he normally write? What is the particular context? When you go into it with that knowledge, you're able to pull so much more from the text, okay? So let me just give us a quick um, breakdown on Ralph Ellison. He is, what I call, he's the Renaissance man. That's what he represents. He, to me, better rep represents the Harlem Renaissance than Richard Wright. I know he's been called the father of the Harlem Renaissance. Um, there's also James Baldwin, who we'll talk about him too. He is unique in that James Baldwin spans several movements. We see his work in Harlem Renaissance, the beginnings of his work in Harlem Renaissance, we see his work in realism, naturalism, modernism, and we also see him in contemporary lit. So J James Baldwin, Jimmy Baldwin, he's unique in that he covers various movements. Ralph Ellison, um, he to me is the seminal figure, the main figure in the Harlem Renaissance. So he's important. Um, just to know a little bit about him, Ralph Waldo Ellison. Look, you guys see he's named after the poet, Ralph Waldo Emerson. So we see um, that influence that perhaps probably played on his um, life. His mother was, um, I believe, a teacher. His father owned a small business. So Ralph Ellison was raised in a progressive home, one that really um, touted the benefits of education. Um, it really, his parents really touted the importance of politics, knowing what's going on in the world um, so that you can uh, stay engaged and participate. So you can have some um, knowledge or bearing on how to change policies or things like that. So his parents is what I'll call woke, okay? They're very conscious and aware of what is needed or necessary to move the black race forward. And that again, keep in mind at this time, um, that is what was on every African-American's mind, right? What can we do to move out of a post-slavery reality? So Ralph Ellison reflects that dream, okay? So we know he was born in a progressive household. He was born in 1914. So his parents were the descendants of slaves. So he still had that perspective. Um, if he was born in 1914, I can guarantee you, he was shaped by the W.E.B. Du Bois text, The Soul of Black Folk, okay? Um, and like someone who would be shaped by that text, we see Ralph Ellison question things around him, okay? He's not really okay with accepting things as they are. And we see that with the character in The Invisible Man. Um, so we know that like the character, Ralph Ellison had similar views, okay? Um, another thing to keep in mind with him, uh, he's from Oklahoma City, Oklahoma. Oklahoma City is unique or Oklahoma was unique at this time in 1914 when he was born because it was a new state. I believe Oklahoma got its statehood in 1907. So with African-Americans after slavery, venturing out, we talked about the uh, great migration where they moved uh, north from, you know, moved from the south up north. There was also a migration where uh, former slaves and their descendants were moving west. And as they were moving west, they were settling in their own land, um, own cities. So some of the most black owned or predominantly black towns were built in Oklahoma 
out west, Oklahoma, Oklahoma, Arkansas at this time. So you guys need to know that Ralph Ellison projects a mindset that may be different from other people in that he saw the possibilities of what can happen when people are given the chance. So he, as being a person who grew up in Oklahoma, and if you guys know anything about Oklahoma, um, have we heard of Black Wall Street? Have we heard of the 1920 race riots in Tulsa, Oklahoma? Um, like, are we familiar with that historical background at all? I see no, okay. I see Jayla says yes. Um, Good. That knowledge is, is somewhat important because if he was born in 1914 and Tulsa was bombed in 1920, right, he's right, he's born right, or he's in Oklahoma right at the cusp of booming Black businesses. Um, he sees trade and education and how the two can come together to create success. So Ralph Ellison has an idea already inside of him that we see play out in his writing. So we know that um, he's all into politics. He's into um, what I call enlightened Black folks. Um, and we'll talk about that. Hold on. Let me not get ahead of myself. Um, some ideas that I noted in his um, background. Guess what he did prior to writing? Well, I know you guys can't guess, sorry. Um, he used to study jazz and blues. Did anybody see in his writing a, an intense uh, focus on jazz and blues? In his writing, did we see an intense focus on jazz and blues? Yes, almost not even an intense focus. He broke that thing down like a science in the prologue in Invisible Man. We're gonna talk about it. But this is why sometimes it's important to read the context before you read a text because in doing so, you guys would know, um, he, he, he's gonna compare everything to jazz and the blues because he used to study that. He wanted to be a musician. His artistic expression prior to him becoming a writer and a poet was a musician. And you guys know the Harlem Renaissance was all about artistic expression, this artistic um, or the use of art to further or communicate the black experience. So when he talks about jazz and blues in the text, he talks about it in relation to the black experience because to him and the new Negro, the Harlem Renaissance, um, you know, for that particular time, they were all about artistic expression, right? If we have this double consciousness, if there's two ways of looking at me, then I'm gonna define me for me. And the way I do so is through this artistic um, expression. So whether that is music, whether it's dance, whether that's sculpture, whether that's poetry and writing, there is this need to artistically assert oneself. So he talks about that in the text. One more thing I wanna lay out about you guys. Um, so we know that he, oh, he was uh, also, he lived um, in a church. When he was younger, I believe Ralph Ellison's father left the family and him and his mother, you know, now that their financial situation changed, they dealt with direct poverty after his father left. And for a short time, they lived in the basement of a church. So in that basement of the church, he often heard sermons. Um, he kind of got that um, connection with black culture. Cause you guys know in your study of the vernacular tradition, gospel sermon, things like that is a part of our culture, black culture. So it's unique to point out that he grew up in, in a, part, a part of his childhood was him living in a basement in a church. Because what is it, where does the invisible man live? I'm gonna keep drawing, the, um, I'm just kind of helping us draw the connections there. Where does the invisible man live, you guys, in the prologue?
Ask it in chat. Right in New York, but but where? Where was his living condition in New York? That's right. He did live in New York, Jayla. Yeah, he did. Where did he, while living in New York, where did he live? What was his living condition? Did I get anything? Harlem. Yeah, that's good too. <laughs> okay, let me help you guys. Harlem is true. He did live in Harlem. He did live in New York. Anybody see that he lived underground? That's what I was hoping. That's what I'm trying to pull out of you guys. He lived underground. His interaction with the world around him was in, when he would come up from underground. Right? You guys remember that? So the invisible man, in a way, reflects Ralph Ellison's experiences. He is the invisible man. And when you look at how he grew up, I can see how those metaphors play for him. He lived in struggling at a time him and his family were struggling financially, emotionally, they mentally, they were they lived underground. They were in the living in the basement of the church, kind of getting this secondhand experience. At, while he was underground, living, you know, as a child in, in the basement of the church, similar experiences is what he speaks to. So something else. Ooh, time is getting away from me. Um, it says, during the time that he was underground, um, his mother would bring down books and magazines that would give him glimpses of the real world. He talked about that. So he knew what was going on in the world, but he still felt disconnected from it. Um, he said, in, you know, through the books or the magazines he would get from his mother, he said, they were things which spoke of a world which I could someday make my own. So he's very clear too that he's living double, he's living a different experience, right? So this whole idea of double consciousness, he not only has a double consciousness of, you know, his blackness and how it is perceived by the world, he has an additional one one that is rooted in poverty, one that is also rooted in him being ob objected, cast aside, right? And that identity is one that he wars against as well. So you guys will see how in the text, when he talked about uh, this battle that he has with, hold on, the light company. Did you guys see that? What did he call it? Here it is. It says, that is why I fight my battle with monopolated, monopolated light and power. He has double meanings in this text where, yes, the double consciousness of him being a man, but also the role that poverty plays. Pay attention to that, you guys, and put make some type of note of it. He's warring. The invisible man is warring with the awareness. That's what Christina Sharp calls the wake. He has an awareness of his condition. He's aware of what's going on. He knows why he's relegated to this place underground. He's speaking to his state of abjection. So he speaks to that on one level. He also knows that what could help him get above ground could be kind of economic footing. So he's aware now too of He's aware of the ship. So we got the wake and we got the ship. He's aware of where he played, where he lands in the system and how the system is some, some kind of working to help keep him underground, to keep him objective. He has an awareness. He talks about it. He then also talks about the light. Hold on, let's get into these questions. Let me get into the questions um, so that some of this explaining I can let the work do for me. 
All right. So a couple of things to know about Ralph Ellison in relation to the text. He is the invisible man. So know a little in knowing more about Ralph Ellison, you will know more about the invisible man situation. Um, so with that being said, can I put it, put what I know about him to rest? Oh, another thing about uh, Ralph Ellison's how who he is plays into the text is he struggled with depression. He struggled with the effects, the trauma of that objection. So he's really into a discussion of the psychological toll of um, being this invisible man, being underground, psychological toll. And I think the reason he's able to speak to that psychological toll is because he himself experienced depression, um, thoughts of suicide, um, moments where his mental health was um, in jeopardy. So he has a unique perspective with the invisible man where he, he can talk about him in terms of cerebral, what is going on mentally and psychologically with him. He speaks really well to that because he himself struggled with that uh, depression. And his depression stemmed from him losing his mother when his mother passed away. Um, he was a young guy. I think he was in his 20s. Um, but that was a situation that changed everything for him. Again, he found himself deep in the depths of depression, um, dealing with um, issues of suicide, mental health. Um, but when he came out of that is when he made the decision to become a writer and to kind of tell these stories. It wasn't until he lost his mother. Prior to that, he was studying, he wanted to become a jazz musician. He was um, studying blues and jazz. It wasn't until a life altering um, situation with his mom that he uh, flipped the page and decided he was gonna become a writer. Now he was trained um, educate in terms of education. He went to Tuskegee College um, in Alabama. Um, so he was a Renaissance man in every true form. He was educated. He knew poetry, he knew um, writing, he did well. Um, he was into music, he knew that, he did well. But in the end, after his mother passes, when he made the decision, I will write, I will kind of tell these stories and make sure I'm informing other. That was in tribute to his mother, okay? So his whole idea in terms of focusing on the wake, this idea of being conscious, this speaking to double consciousness. That is him nodding. That's a nod to his mother, you guys. He does this intentionally, just like Christina Sharp talked about how her mother created this environment for them where she worked hard to present love and a place that's safe. Um, he was aware that his mother too had an awareness of you know being knowledgeable, get your education, um, study this information so that you can help others. So with her putting that in him, he made that um, conscious choice to become a writer. And as a result, we have the invisible man, which is called one of the ground, it is considered the groundbreaking novel of the 20th century. So when you talk about contemporary literature, the hallmark piece is Ralph Ellison's um, Invisible Man, it still stands as a hallmark piece of um, the idea that's infused in African-American lit. This uh, working out, exercising our demons, so to speak, right? Talking about it psychologically, telling the stories of, first of all, so we know you're not alone. It's a community in terms of you're sharing experiences. But also he speaks to it in order now to make changes. Now that you have this awareness, what are you gonna do with it? And if you guys remember in chapter one, Christina Sharp called this wake work. Now that you, you're woke, what are you gonna do with the knowledge that, with the awareness that you have? So we see this play out in The Invisible Man. Let's talk about these questions. Um, 
Hold on. So the assignment asked students to, uh, after reading the text, um, the prologue to Ralph Ellison's Invisible Man, you guys were asked to answer questions um, for discussion. So the questions were, oh, they're not showing me all of it. These questions may have been a little bit more um, difficult or entail. What do you guys think about the questions? Were they were they difficult? Did we struggle answer, answering these questions? Okay, good, Jayla. I'm glad. Um, but I, I intentionally tried to dig a little bit deeper with these questions. Um, as we're moving into our halfway point, we're again starting week six, we ought to be approaching our reading a, with a little bit more of a close eye. There should be at this particular point in the semester when, our, when I'm asking you guys, what'd you take from the reading? We should be able to, to spout out um, blurbs of what we took away from the reading based on how we connected to everything else that we've read, right? So. Now that you guys have more of a vocabulary, now that you guys have more of a um, background in the discussions of this, certain questions, I'm looking for you guys to make connections. I'm looking for us to really um, dive into the questions of with the knowledge that you have in us discussing our readings, with the knowledge you guys of how to have on how to read African-American literature. We ought to be answering these questions and reading the text a tad bit deeper. Um, so it's what I call college level discussions at this point. Um, so again, as you guys are reading your text with week six, we know read context. Don't just ever just dive into the text. At this point, you need to look at who wrote it. When did they write it? Let me go find out who that person is and what was going on at that time. That is a part of how you read it. And when you have that knowledge, then we're able to get a, a whole lot deeper into these questions. So even though we may not do it every time, I'm going to approach reading as though you guys did it, because that is the ex expectation. OK, so these questions are digging a little bit deeper into um, consideration of everything else we've read and everything else you guys have learned in the class. So the first question asks to explain what the narrator, narrator is saying in this passage. And the passage is here. Um, what does the metaphor invisible mean here in terms of identity? So I am an invisible man. No, I am not a spook like those who haunted Edgar Allan Poe, nor am I one of your Hollywood movie ectoplasms. I am a man of substance, of flesh and bone, fiber and liquids. And I might even be said to possess a mind. I am invisible, understand, simply because people refuse to see me. So students were asked um, to explain what did they think he meant? What is he, what does he mean when he uses the metaphor invisible? So um, based on that, I really wanted to see how you guys related to this question. So I am aware of my time. So we're gonna kind of move through these questions quickly. But let me look at what I have. So Jayla says, um, I believe the narrator is trying to tell the reader that he is not one thing and he deems himself to be valued and not to be looked over. He states, I am a man of substance, which to me is a statement he explains as a point to respect him. I like that. Um, you say also the metaphor invisible means an individual in the sense of not being boxed in by what society prejudges him to be. Good. What I like about your response, Jayla, is you directly answered the question. What does he mean by invisible? And you say he means that he's an invisible, um, he's invisible, not of course in the literal sense. We know metaphors don't speak in literal sense, but 
symbolically, he means that he may feel boxed in and that he feels prejudged by society, right? I get that, absolutely. Let's see what um, Robin added. Uh, she says he means um, under valid, well, unvalidated, undervalued. I, that's language I saw in your answer as well, Jayla, this value, lack of value, undervalued um, or respected. You also said respect. All right. You see, you guys see how when we talk about it together, I'm able to see what you guys took from it. And good. We're taking away the same things. Um, you, Robin pointed out he is invisible, not because he chooses to be. He was clear in pointing that out. I'm invisible because that's how people, you know, um, choose to see me. And you pointed to that too, Jayla, by putting him in a box or prejudging. Um, it says, she said, he's not invisible because he chooses to be, not because he is a ghost spirit or hoax or because he's not real. He lets us know that he is real. That's exactly what he did with that quote. That if in case you're confused, <laughs> right? He lays it out. He said he is alive and he is intelligent. And it's important that he asserts that. So they both talk to the fact that he asserts this. He is only this invisible because people refuse to see him. And I like how Robin pointed out, putting it back on the voyeur, right? The person who, who, who's doing the scene. Um, the fact that you choose not to see me doesn't mean I lack an identity. <laughs> like it doesn't mean I don't have an identity. It doesn't mean that that human um, element of me isn't there. It's just that you choose not to see it. And this is revolutionary, you guys in terms of addressing that double, you know, the veil, right? So he's revolutionary in making these statements. No one has really explored, and this is where we go to the psychology. No one has really explored the impact of the objection, abjection. So he's explaining that. He does a good job of laying that out good. So, but we see the psychology here. He's saying, oh, no, it's you. You know, it's not me. And he's clear of that. Him being clear of that, too, puts him in the realm of he's aware. So I always take awareness to mean the wake. Awareness, remember how we defined it with Christina Sharp? He's woke. Okay? And it's nothing more frustrating than to be woke around people who aren't woke, right? He, he explained that with his encounter with, when he finally come above ground, his encounter with the white guy who wanted to, you know, he threw out a racial slur and the invisible man wants to fight, but we can see in the text, he only wants to fight to assert his humanness. So he sometimes says, I have to fight just so they know I'm real. Did you guys see that in the text? He talked about fighting battles, this war, he uses this language and it's intentional. He uses the language battle. He uses, uses the language war. He uses language like casualty. So through his use of uh, language, it's clear he's, there's a, there's a struggle. There's a uh, global struggle to be seen, to be heard, to be viewed as human. And through the metaphor of the invisible man, he's speaking to that um, issue. All right, good. This one, Tasha added. Um, the narrator is saying that no one sees him for who he is. Um, yes, I'll take that. He absolutely does. All right, let's look at, at the second question. Um, what does the author mean? when he describes his state or his reality by using the term hibernation. So I'm telling you guys, pay attention to how it's used in the text. Hibernation here is a metaphor. And when we talk about metaphors, which is the tool of the black vernacular, that's the tool. They're, the language always is going to present this drama. It is going to, um, be adorned. Remember they talked about the language being this embellishment. Um, rather than him just directly addressing it, he uses metaphor. So hibernation 
is a symbol. It means something. So I asked you guys, what did you think he meant when he used that term? Point to other instances that you glimpse the narrator's awareness or consciousness at work. Um, Tasha, you stated when the author was describing his state of reality um, and the term of hibernation, he was saying how he was dead, but he really wasn't dead, that he was sleep. So you're saying he meant hibernation here as um, him being kind of in a sleeping mode, which I, I, I see that. Now, one thing with these questions, you guys want, may want to get just a tad bit more in detail or maybe just a tad bit more specific um, in your responses because it's, I can see what you're saying here, but I would, I'm, I'm still like, okay, now clarify that. Now make that a tad bit more um, plain. So you're saying he was sleep or um, no, 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 dead in a state of sleep. So we can put dead as well, but you know, really not. He referred to it as kind of lying in wait, but we'll talk about that. All right, so you see that Tasha, let me go back and see what Robin perhaps added. How did I get out of that? All right, so Robin says, I think the author is preparing for his time. I like that. Because what is hibernation? Preparing for his time. Hibernation is a, it's a preparatory act. Squirrels hibernate or they start to put, um, you know, acorns away or put food away in preparation for hibernation. It, there's a per, there's a preparing that um, hibernation speaks to. The bear, he goes all summer or spring and he eats everything in sight to put on weight in preparation for the winter. So hibernation here speaks to a preparatory act. So he's like, I'm underground, but don't look at it as though I'm dead or as though I'm sleeping. I'm underground because I'm laying in wait. I'm watching. I'm preparing to make my move. So he's very, he's intentional in use of the word hibernation. Just like I told you guys with Christina Sharp in African American Lit, the language is everything. So what you don't want to do is take language for face value. So just kind of like with Christina Sharp, abjection and dysgraphia. Oh, you don't want to treat that as though it's nothing. I'm telling you, the um, wealth, the message is in the language, right? So the fact that he used hibernation is, is really important. So I like what she says here. He is in a state, uh, he's preparing. He's waiting for his time, preparing for his time. He's clear, he's clear on that. I like that. Oh, I keep going back out to submissions. That's what's taking me out. My bad. Let me look at Jayla real quick. Let's see what you added here. Good. So this, even this response, you guys, I like it because I get a good, I get a good grasp. Even if I'm not clear, I got a little bit more explanation to help me be clear. So on the reading questions maybe a little bit longer than just a single sentence response can kind of help um, tie out or lay down meaning. Um, so here it says, da -da -da -da. on page five, Ellison writes, I say this all to assure you that it is incorrect to assume that I am invisible and I live in a hole, that because I'm invisible and I live in a hole, I am dead. For I am in a state of hibernation. You say, to me, Ellison uses the word hibernation in a sense to not count him all the way out. Yep, I like that. Don't count me out. Okay, you say also, you know, as, as one would do in uh, relegating someone as dead. You also say in relation or acceptance and being generalized, not in him on person, but that it would seem that way, then he simply will snap out of it like a hibernate. Mm -hmm. Good. So you tied in the 
metaphor. This is what you did, Jayla. You, you tied in the metaphor. Here's what he meant. This is how it relates to how he used it. So like a bear who, who's hibernating, right? I may be out of view for a while. Oh, but I'm not gone. And no, I'm not underground, just twiddling my thumbs and doing nothing. I'm underground waiting for my opportunity to come up. And oh, when I come up, you better watch out. Did you guys notice that? This speaks to me only because I know a little bit of Ralph Ellison prior to reading this. This, is, this mirrors his experience when he lived in that basement and his mother would bring him things to read from um, the uh, outside world, right? She's bringing him books, she's bringing him magazines so he can see what's going on. He's preparing for the world that's out there. He's not um, totally closed off or dead, right? He said, don't think just because I live in a hole that I'm not you know, engaged. He said, from time to time, I'll come out of my hole and see what's going on. But he's plotting and planning, um, you know, he's preparing himself to come out. And the way that he prepares himself is by, it's through this awareness, this awakening, he's reading, he's studying, he is um, again preparing, um, he's working, right? And when he has con uh, considered himself approved, then he'll kind of come up, um, you know, able again to engage. He said, once he's able to come up, they won't be able to relegate me you know, underground again. So he's working on a plan. I think that that's kind of what he meant when he said in hibernation. All right, where's another question? Let me start here with you, Jayla, since I'm here. Um, what does the light metaphor, oh, I like this one. What does the light stand for? Yeah, I'm sorry, what does light stand for in this metaphor? Um, it says, explain. And I think I gave you guys a quote. So let me go and see if I can pull up this quote. All right, the quote is, even though our narrator lives underground, he describes his hole as full of light. He goes on to say, perhaps you'll think it's strange that an invisible man should need light, desire light, love light, but maybe it is because I am invisible, right? So someone who's in the darkness, they'll crave light, right? What does he mean by light? What does this metaphor stand for in the text, okay? So you guys were asked about that. Let me see what, what we have here in terms of responses. Because the light is a metaphor he used throughout the prologue. So it's not by accident when you guys see things um, repetitively, when it shows up time and time again. In African-American lit, that repetition means they're trying to drive home a point. There's a theme, underlying theme I'm attempting to um, show you, to illuminate for you. Uh, so let's look here. Um, you pointed out. I believe light is used to describe his realities and it's authentic and how it's authentic through the darkness, darkest of times. So you say his reality. So light equals the reality. You say it allows me to feel my vital aliveness. Okay. Look, am I missing something on this? Ooh, and then you use this example. Okay, I see more. So you talked, you brought up the nightmare. Oh my goodness, I think so. Hold on, am I reading this wrong? Um, Jayla, look, is this how this ended? I think this it looks like something's cutting it off a little bit. That is blocking off some of the responses. Let me see what Robin says here. Um, I think that he is referring to life and the abundance of it. So she says light as life. It may, trying to make us understand that even though black people are treated and thought of as less, we are still human and desire the same. Okay, I see that. All right, good. Let me see what Tasha said on it. Oh man, I keep doing this. Oh no, Tasha's here. The light could stand for attention. Okay, you say attention. 
in that he seems like he needs attention, but he doesn't want to feel like he needs to be the prime focus or attention seeker. Somewhat. Um, keep in mind, too, with the uh, metaphorical reading, this is symbol. So light is a symbol. So we sometimes you don't want to take it so literally in that I can guarantee you he didn't mean it literally. But when he talks about light, this illumination, right? Um, and he talked about how invisible people may need it, right? After all, they are invisible. Light in this um, particular metaphor, he's talking about education. He's talking about um, getting like an understanding, formulating an understanding, light. And we see this, and I know I'm a minute over. I'm just gonna read this one last quote and I'm letting this go. But in the text, such a good text, the light. Oh, he goes, he goes in about the light. He says, and then we'll talk about the boomerang, but we'll talk about that on Wednesday. I have been boomeranged across my head so much that I now can see the darkness of lightness. Okay, he talks about the darkness of lightness. So he's saying, I have been hitting the head with it so much that now I can see what it really is. Now I'm able to, you know, now I get it. Ding, ding, ding. That's his learning, right? That's a knowledge he's, he's um, developed. It's, it's, it's hit me in my head so much that I know what the issue is, right? Um, the light, so through this darkness, um, he's seeking out what, what could be the problem? What really is the issue, right? If I'm taking it just on a global, a more global issue, maybe he may say, what is it about my blackness that has put us in such a state? You know, what is it about, you know, who we are or who I am as a person that would explain how we ended up as the abjected, right? He's trying to figure it out. What is, what is happening? And that's how trauma is. When you're traumatized, you know, when humans are treated like objects or like containers, it, it tends to be almost a shock to your system. So when he says this boomerang hit me in the head, he's like, I kind of keep getting knocked back on this. What is this thing that keeps relegating us or relegating me to this placement and in his search of it he's he's finding things that it's giving him answers right he has again this awareness and that's what he refers to as the light right in when people are so prone not to see you it's important that you know who you are people in the dark especially need light because if not without that you'll take on whatever form they place on you so if we're dealing with this idea of double consciousness, it's important for you to have a consciousness for yourself. That's what he refers to as the light. Without that consciousness, you really are invisible. You Now you're relegated and defined by the darkness. They can define you any way they see you when you don't know any better. So his light in this term speaks to metaphorically to, you gotta have some knowledge, knowledge of self. Okay, his light speaks to knowledge of self. When you don't have that knowledge, or whether it be knowledge of self, whether it be education, whether it be the wake or just an overall consciousness or awareness, when you don't have that, you're at their mercy. You're at the outsider. They can define you because you have no way of really defining yourself. So when he talks about the light, he means you have to have knowledge. You have to know who you are. If you don't know who you are, they are going to take you through that thing, right? So he speaks about light. Oh my gosh. I'm sorry, you guys. One more. And then we'll, he says, and so it is with me. No, no, no. You brought up Jayla, the, the nightmare, the beautiful girl that talked about how she lay in the center of a large dark room and felt her face expand until it filled the whole room, becoming a formless mass while her eyes ran in bilious jelly up the chimney. And so it was with me. Look at that. And so it was with me. So he's making a conclusion from that. If you sit in the dark, so that's lack of knowledge, lack of consciousness, lack of awareness, then 
you fill up that darkness with um, those ideas. So in the dark, the formless sometimes can be formed. So he's saying, no, don't let the darkness form you. You have to form yourself for yourself, right? So he says here, without light, I am not only invisible, but formless as well. So without knowledge of self, not only are the people not able to see me, but I can't even assert my, myself to them. I can tell you who I am. I'm not able to form, um, let's say a body or a, a this real reality um, if I don't know it for myself. He's able to tell the people I'm not invisible. He's able to tell people, oh, I'm not invisible. I'm a man, I'm human. Cause he has that light, he has that knowledge. That are weird. But someone who doesn't have that knowledge, well, yeah, they may say, you're not a man, you may accept that, because you don't have anything to place it against. You're just this formless figure that they can attach anything to. So he's talking about consciousness, education, awareness. Um, he goes on to say, formless as well. And to be unaware of one's form is to live a death. Remember how he said, oh, I'm not dead. I guess you can say I'm asleep. But, I, but to him, if you don't know who you are, if you don't have any awareness, if you don't have any uh, education of oneself, then you might as well be dead. He said, without that, you're dead. But he opened up in saying, I am an invisible man. He made it clear. He asserted that, but I'm not dead by no means. I'm a human, I'm flesh and blood, although some may not see me that way. He's speaking in the light. He's created a form for himself, right? So the light that he's talking about is one that made it necessary for him to live in that um, underground, right? Okay, we'll put this to bed for now. Um, so now that I'm kind of talking about that, did you guys see that in the text? Ooh, we. We're gonna talk about it on Wednesday. If had I not had to go back into Christina Sharp, we really could have got um, through most of it, but without knowledge of those metaphors in this text, you guys will not be able to make sense of what you're reading. It just won't make sense. He's heavy handed with the metaphors. So without it, you'll miss Ralph Ellison's point. He's giving you his message through the symbols, like so much of African-American literature. Sometimes I don't, I may not want the others to know what I'm saying. So I'm gonna give it to you a different way. Some people read this today and they think that it tells the story of a guy who lived underground, who was mad at the world because they, you know, wouldn't acknowledge him. Mm -hmm. Is that really the story? You'll miss it if you miss those symbols of those metaphors, because um, he's telling a much broader broader story here. It is his story. He's telling how he's able to survive um, as an invisible man. He's telling um, what it took to kind of rise above. Did you guys see how when he talked about light, he said, when I'm talking about light, I'm not talking about the ones in Times Square that you'll see downstairs that lights up Broadway or um, you know downtown. He's like, I'm not talking about that light. Because there's many people who walk in that light and they're still dead, right? He said, I'm talking about the light that comes from one knowing oneself. So when he made that distinction, he's talking about knowledge. So the light here, the metaphor for light means knowledge. So we'll pick up from there on Wednesday. But here's what I need you guys to do in terms of homework. Um, we've talked about this and I talked about this last week. Um, the reading of Toni Morrison's Rootedness. So I threw this out last week. Um, did anybody get a chance to read Toni Morrison's Rootedness? And there shouldn't be any shame if you say no, I'm okay. But did we get a chance to read it? If you did, take it through another read. If you did get a chance to read it, because it was assigned, I think, during week four or week five module. If you get a chance to read it again, read it now with the knowledge of metaphor, right? Is there any double meaning in anything that she states here? And make sure you're kind of clear 
on what she means. Any, any of you who may know Toni Morrison, oh, she's dripped, drenched in metaphors. That is how she rolls. So you cannot read her if you don't have a knowledge of the culture, the vernacular language she plays in metaphor, okay? So we'll talk about that. Rootedness is on page, I believe it's 10. Hold on, you guys. We're done too, so. Um, that is page 1067. So I'll put it on Brightspace. 1067, Wednesdays, class. We're gonna answer reading questions. Your weekly reading questions will be on Toni Morrison's rootedness. So please come prepared and ready to discuss. I don't know if you guys know, this is somewhat of my more um, quiet group, but we see when Robin's not here, there's almost no, no talking in the class. And I want you guys to know, oh, I'm not gonna be able to do that. Those of you who had me before, you know how cl my classes drive on the discussions. So next week, um, not next week, Wednesday, come ready to verbally talk about Toni Morrison's rootedness. There'll be a couple of questions um, we'll cover in class on that. All right. Um, if you guys have no questions for me, um, you guys are free to go. Sorry for carrying you over. I know I apologize all the time. I will get better with that. Okay. But other than that, if you guys have nothing for me, um, I'll let you go. Just make sure you guys are reading the Toni Morrison text. That's where we'll pick up. All right, my people, have a good one. Tasha, did you need me? Well, I didn't know you didn't have any internet and I had sent you an email. About my Sorry, Tasha. Guess what? Let me tell you what just happened. It's been muted the whole time. Have people been talking in class? Uh, one person did. <laughs> I just looked down. I'm like, oh, I got everybody muted. I'm so sorry. Now go ahead and start from the beginning of what you said because I caught you in the middle. Oh, I said that I had sent an email about my PowerPoint because the, the article that I was looking at, it goes into the men, but in between the last paragraph with the women, you could click on it. Can I do use that? Hold on, let me pull up the email. So you said you sent me an email. Hold on, let me double check it, Tasha. Cause um, hold on, one minute. I don't mind you bringing up up the men. You know, it's okay. the The focus is the women, but there were mm -hmm. men writers in the contemporary um move. You know, period as well. But hold on, let me see. Let me go back to your question, Tasha. I'm sorry. Here it is. Oh, you sent me two, Tasha. Oh, and I see what you asked the question about submitting for the um, question. It was in mm -hmm. text. I'm sorry, I don't oh, know how I, I missed no word. Yeah, it's okay though, you, you did good. That's my bad, Tasha. I don't know how I missed this email. I really don't. And the, and the women renaissance you sent, hold on, you sent me another. You said, so when you was looking up for your project, some of your results go into, oh, wait a minute. This ain't what you told me. Tell me one more time your question, Tasha. I'm not seeing it. Okay. It goes into the men, but in between one of the texts for the women, I think it's the 21st, 20th or 21st century. Yeah. It has it in blue with some of the authors, like Maya Angelou, a couple yeah. of two other 